Welcome uh, to Authors Night with the East Hampton Library. Uh, this event is generally sponsored by CIB Private Wealth Management, uh, the Hilaria and Alec Baldwin Foundation, Patty Kenner, uh, Barbara and Stephen Heyman, uh, Michelle Tortorelli and Tom Kearns, and Janet C. Ross. Uh, we are pleased to present Marcus Samuelson being interviewed by Florence Fabricant. At the end of this interview, there'll be a Q&A. Uh, so if you'd like to type your questions into the chat window, uh, they'll be acknowledged toward the end of the uh, interview. And without further ado, I'd like to turn over the floor to uh, Florence Fabricant. Thank you. And thank you everybody for joining us to uh, participate, I hope, in this uh, virtual interview. Uh, the last time I interviewed Marcus, it wasn't virtual, it was in person and it was a lot of fun. Um, but what can you do? So Marcus, um, did you cook dinner last night? Uh, I did, but I wanna go back to that last time also had one of your fabulous tarts. I remember that we went back to your house and you cooked really nice dinner with a fabulous, I wanna say plum tart fig. or peach. Fig. Fig. No, fig, fig. It was delicious. So yes, when people said it was better in the old days, on that night, it was better in the old days. <laughs> <laughs> so what did you make for dinner last night? Uh, I. I cooked at the restaurant and then I came home. Um, I just did a rice dish uh, for my wife. We just had some rice with vegetables. I find myself without going fully plant-based, I find myself eating much more plant-based food. Mm -hmm. um, and we both, I mean, I think it started at the during the pandemic that we just, we didn't fully stop, but we just ate less fish and meat. And uh, we've been going ever since. I mean, I do eat meat, I do eat fish, but it was just been nice eating more plant-based food. You know what I've found during the pandemic and doing all this cooking at home is you buy vegetables and rarely do you buy a single vegetable that's going to be at dinner and then you're, you've used it up. When you buy vegetables, you buy enough for several meals as contrasted yeah. to buying a certain amount of fish or meat or chicken. Yeah. And that lends itself to experimenting. And uh, I can't tell you how many vegetable soups I've made, leftover vegetables in the blender. That's great. Do you cook it all from your new book? The book is, uh, so everybody knows, it's behind Marcus. You can see it with the yellow writing. Uh, it's called The Rise, Black Cooks and the Soul of American Food. And it's uh, profiles of dozens of Black chefs in America with some homage to uh, Black chefs who are no longer with us, like uh, the famous Patrick Clark, who was at Tavern on the Green, and recipes from these chefs. And uh, so my question is, Marcus, do you cook from this book? And have what have you learned from your own book? Yes. Yeah. I mean, first of all, it, it, the book took, my book takes a long time. It's a four year project each book. And I learned something from the book each time. And I felt that uh, African-Americans contribution to American food has been tremendous, uh, not always acknowledged and recognized fully. And this was a way to honor the past and talk about the past in terms of incredible chefs like Miss Leah Chase that just passed away two years ago from Duke Chase, for example. Edna Lewis, and so on. And then in order to acknowledge first the past, you can now talk about present and future. There are some amazing um, uh, chefs of color in this country. Um, and I wanted to highlight chefs like Chef Eric that have worked at Le Bernardin for 20 years, so you know, and uh, chefs like um, Nina Compton. So when people travel in this country, when you go to New Orleans next time, go and visit Miss Chef. Nina Compton, and also acknowledge the future. There's um, the youngest member, she's 20 years old, Patricia Gonzalez. And hopefully when, when she uh, becomes an executive chef, uh, the landscapes looks a little bit more diverse. And I think we've done 
we've come far and we got a long way to go. In terms of the food, it's delicious. You know, like four of the cuisines in American food stem from black cooking. Um, it's, you know, you think about Southern, right? Think about low country. There's aspects of barbecue and Creole. Those are all four major cuisines that are unique in one shape or another to this country. And I cook from all four of them constantly. Yeah, uh, let me raise a little point for our uh, audience. You mentioned Chef Eric at La Bernada. Marcus was not referring to Eric Repair, who is <laughs> co-owner and executive chef. He was referring to the executive chef, Eric Gestel, who is a native of Martinique and has been at Eric Repair's side in the kitchen for these 20 years. Uh, uh, since Eric, almost since the time Eric Repair took over from Gilbert Lacoste. Mm -hmm. And uh, he's a really sweet guy and mm -hmm. really, really talented and should get more recognition than he does, I think. Yeah, and it's also sometimes his personality. His personality is very quiet and, and, and so on. But everyone in, in the industry that is inside the industry know Chef Castell and, and He's also been a mentor to many people like Adrian Cheetham that's now doing her residence at Stone Barn, came out of Le Bernardin, worked under both Eric Repair and Eric Estelle and Adrian worked for many years with me as well. So there is a next generation of black cooking or American food in this country, uh, looks great. You know, you have tremendous of talented chefs that I want to be highlighted, Nisha Arrington in Los Angeles, Kwame, um, Gregory, there's a, multiple chefs and that's my point black food is not monolithic you know when we think about music we know that black music and contribution to this country it's not one thing you talk about jazz gospel r&b hip-hop um rock and roll you name it there's a very good sort of segues for us to go into when it comes to food unless you're a foodie, it's a little bit harder to understand it. But just, you know, like if you're Jamaican black, your food will be different than if you're Ethiopian black. If you're Southern, you have a different narrative and experience just like you have uh, with other diaspora cuisines. You know what I mean? It's, it's, it's regional. And I think in the Book of the Rise, it was an opportunity to really like unpack it, talk about it and celebrate it. Exactly. And your experience is a little unusual in that you, <clears throat> you are a Black chef, a well-acknowledged, highly uh, uh, lauded Black chef who has done extremely well. You've got your own restaurants and so forth, but you did not grow up eating American Black food. And how long, I mean, when you came to the U.S., how did you adapt? What did you learn when you came from, I think, Sweden to, uh, to America to uh, first sample what there was on offer from the Black culinary uh, mm -hmm. story? Well, I think, Florence, just like most immigrant experiences, it's not linear, you know, or as immigrants, wherever you come from, uh, you have one experience and one knowledge. And then when you come to this incredible country, you learn a lot, especially if you're in the food industry, because we're curious as you, you know, your curiosity is think about how much food that you've seen over the years. Right. And it's your curiosity that gets you there. And uh, yes, my experience being born in Africa and raised in Sweden and worked in France and Japan and so on. Yeah, it's very different. But um, I would argue if you would know any chef, it's always been a journey based on travel, where they're born and where they've gone to. It's always an incredible story most of the times, right? So in my case, um, I learned about African-American cooking here. And I felt like I had to move to Harlem to fully understand it. When I lived in Midtown, I knew I couldn't open Red Rooster living in Midtown. I had to live the experience in Harlem. And my father has a PhD in geology. It took him seven years to get. And it took me eight years between moving to Harlem and opening Red Rooster. So it took about the same amount of time because you have to <laughs> study. And for me, it was not just study the food only. It was also understand the culture, right? That 
uh, a lot of the food that I wanted to experience wasn't fun, was a lot, almost like what we'd call it underground. And, you know, a lot of cool experiences in black culture comes from underground, hip hop, jazz, and so on. And then it becomes pop culture. Same with the food. The best cornbread, I didn't find it in a restaurant. I found it in an after church uh, program, right? They, there was women that were cooking. The best jerk chicken, I found it in the park. So it's very different from, from when, how I worked when I worked in Midtown where I could follow a list, ask a friend and go to that restaurant and experience it. Here, I had to really speak to people like Lana Turner, like Thelma Golden, like artists, and they invited me to their homes. And that's really how I learned it. I also learned it by traveling to the South, spending time with uh, both Edna Lewis, Leah Chase, um, and uh, incredible, pre predominantly women, black women that either invited me to their homes or invited me to the restaurants. And um, it was, I was fascinated by it. And I thought, wow, what a great way to relearn and um, change my, uh, my philosophy in food in many ways. And it took eight years to develop it. Yeah, you know, in a lot of cultures, especially in Africa, um, the cooking is done by women. Mm -hmm. Even in many of the restaurants, the cooking is done by women. In the U.S., not so much. Women are more associated with home cooking, but I think they're the ones, like your experience with people like Leah Chase, they're the ones that really gave light to what is in the African-American uh, repertory and what there is to eat because it was handed down from generation to generation before these people had restaurants. Yeah, I mean, um, Leah is one in a billion, you know, Miss Leah started the restaurant or st started working for Duke Chase, which was her husband's parents' restaurant in the 30s. She changed and took over the restaurant in the 40s where she actually broke the law by serving black and white people every day <laughs> and talking about being right there in the civil rights movement in the 40s and the 50s. A lot of the civil rights movements was planned in her restaurant. So, so much what I stand on uh, and the freedom that I have today, I have to thank to uh, the generation before me, like Miss Leah Chase. So I feel like there's enormous privilege, but it's also with that privilege comes responsibility. And with that, I feel like a chef with, um, a chef, a black chef with a large platform, I have to present and broadcast the next generation of young talent. Well, you're doing that when uh, I think you're the uh, spokesman or are you the director or some, what is your title at CCAP? Well, I, I'm a co-chair of co -chair. CCAP okay. and, um, you know, Richard Grousman has done such an incredible job with, together with Tim Sagatz and Al, Al Roker uh, and the entire board to really uh, highlight young urban cooks in high school, uh, work towards giving them a scholarship in the culinary arts, which both you and I have judged a competition many, many times. And um, you think about how many young African-American chefs have come through CCAP's program. We're now in nine states and we have sommeliers, we have chefs, we have owners of their own restaurant. But the most what we have, Florence, is a middle, a bunch of great young culinarians that come to our field and they provide for their family and create a more diverse landscape. And that could not have been done without um, CCAP. And, one of the reasons why I've slowed down a little bit is because this year is the 20th anniversary or memory of 9-11. And I remember judging a CCAP competition with you at Windows of the World. Oh, yeah. About 20 years ago. Yeah. And just yeah. I mean, like when you said it, I was like, <laughs> wow, we were there with our pants and going over everything. And that was about 20 years ago. Yeah, that's true. Uh, yeah, well, time flies in a yeah. way. Uh, so it's interesting now to see so many black chefs 
rising through the ranks and many of them also establishing their own restaurant. About 15, 20 years ago, I did an article for the New York Times about women restaurateurs when there were many fewer than there are now. And one of, one of the cities that had seemed to have the most was San Francisco. And I asked a few chefs, uh, why is that? And they said that the banks were more willing to oh, lend wow. women and that it was easier for them to open. Tell me about the financing of a black chef wanting to open a restaurant. Is that a real hurdle or wow. are things becoming easier? Well, first of all, uh, fantastic that you broadcasted, highlighted that issue of women chef and I, it just like 20 years ago, that's, it's, it's just trailblazing and equally important today as it was then. So thank you for that. Um, the wealth gap in the black community is well-documented and it's real. There's two things, there's, a, there's generational wealth gap and it's the access to institutional money, right? And especially coming out of the pandemic. So I worked, I, I got a lot of numbers during the pandemic. And one number that was really astonishing to me was that 40% of all African-American businesses will close forever because of the pandemic. And think about that. Those businesses are majority of mom and pops, which means that it's their family savings. And when you save up for a business like that, you just, there's no more money to get, right? So we will see a drop off of entrepreneurship because of the pandemic, specifically in the black and brown community. So um, I just been working a lot with a lot of different companies and brands to how can we drive traffic to these restaurants? I worked with, for example, Uber Eats, where we uh, were highlighted and brought $26 million to African-American businesses during the pandemic. Uh, I have a partnership with Pepsi that has a goal to raising $100 million over uh, uh, years to black and brown businesses. So institutional money and people can also, if we know about this issue, people are, majority of people are good people and they are curious. So if they know they can help somebody by their own dollar, by going to that business or buying a swag from the restaurant or buying a gift card from that restaurant. We've seen so many creative ways where our customers have really rescued and helped the restaurant. So I see a glimmer of hope when we finally come out of the pandemic, we're still not out of it. Um, and I've actually seen more work in collaborations. Um, things like Independent Restaurant Coalition came together very quickly, as you know, during the restaurant, um, during the pandemic. Yeah, uh, the beginning. And from the beginning. So it's all this type of work that need to highlight the smallest restaurateurs. And, and at the same time, come up with entrepreneurial pro, uh, projects so people will have access to funding because we're going to need it. Uh, oh, yeah. We're going to need it. Yeah. Um, to move on to food, though, because I have a feeling that that's, that's really what has attracted our audience. Um, and let's assume that most of the people who have tuned in um, are not as familiar with Fufu or how to cook a plantain or some of those sure. things. If, if somebody wanted to expand their horizons, say, and go beyond uh, just Italian style or American home style, or even what might be perceived as Southern or summertime barbecue, and start to understand the tastes and the ingredients that produce those tastes for a lot of African-American dishes. Can you name a few ingredients that it would be a good idea to have on your pantry shelf to start Africanizing one's food? Sure, I mean, I think actually one doesn't at all have to go to extremes, right? I think that if you think about collard greens, for example, or kale, you know, you can make, we all made a great kale salad. You can make the same kale salad with collards, for example. Maybe you want to chop them up a little bit. Uh, and, you know, maybe uh, you want to 
massage that, them in that vinaigrette a little bit longer, for example, because it could be a little tougher, but also the way you cook, cook them, if you want to slow cook them and add vinegar to them. You know, for me, collards is something that you can eat throughout the year, raw, cooked, in vinegar, smoked. And if you think also about so much of the ingredients that we today take for granted, like okra, like peanuts, like rice came to this country through Africa, for example, broken rice, which is an incredible ingredient, like right? it's the leftover rice, so you can, you know, you find so much in Southeast Asia and West Africa, broken rice salad, you just take some rice, cook it, boil it or toast it. And you make a beautiful uh, summer salad with that with corn and tomatoes. So sometimes when you cook African food, it does not have to be to the biggest extreme. If you want to go even further to the continent itself, I would start in a country where you spent a lot of time and written about Morocco. There's an amazing spices that comes from Marrakesh, which is not spicy. If you think about the spice plants in Africa, in Morocco is very often cardamom, cumin, coriander based, right? Well, that now, goes- Tunisian is spicier because Tunisia uses harissa. Yeah which is a spice paste, which yeah. they really don't use much in Morocco. Yeah. Morocco is more uh, seasonings and herbaceous touches like chermoula. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's a good place to start. Yeah. But then, then again, so are other countries yeah. and what they have to offer. Now, what you were saying about collards, mm -hmm. I would suggest that people substitute collards when they're going to use kale. Mm -hmm. or even spinach. Yeah. You know, you make a Greek spinach pie, you yeah. can make it African by adding collards. You wow. know, there's nothing wrong with that. And sweet potato leaves, for example. So there's a lot of things in our culture that are there. Cooking with sweet potato and cooking with sweet potato leaves is super delicious, for example. There is so much out of the African pantry that is already in the American pantry. When I think about coconut milk, for example, you go to the Caribbean, Something that I love a lot is Caribbean food like jerk chicken, for example. And there are many different of jerk variations that you can buy. So you can really pull back on the heat level or pull, you know, or, or, or add more heat to it, depending on where you are. I mean, corn, we're now in corn season, right? One of the easiest way I would love for people to try is just grill the corn, brush them with a little bit of butter, and then toast off some coconut flakes with some smoked paprika and just add that to the corn and you get a completely different taste of the corn and it's super delicious. So sometimes for me, explore, be curious and it's gonna take you to a great place. Yeah, yeah. Uh, are you putting more African style ingredients and food on your menus at Red Rooster and elsewhere? I, you know, uh, we just finished, uh, I mean, 2020 was a very difficult year, but you know, at Red Rooster, we served a lot of people in the community together with right. World yeah. Central Kitchen. But then what we also got to do was we opened Red Rooster in Miami, in right. Old Town. And first we opened, then we closed. And <laughs> then eventually we opened Marcus Restaurant in Bahamas at Balmar. And I say that because obviously in Miami, you're in a tropical part of the world. And in Bahamas, you're very, you know, the proximity to Miami is right there. So a lot of the ingredients we have in those menus are from the continent, right? We use coconut milk the way maybe we use cream in when I grew up in Sweden, for example. We use things like plantains in both places a lot, just the way a Swede or a European would use potatoes, for example, right? We do use sweet potato leaves and, and so on. So the food for me, it's about making it delicious. Um, we can all taste the same, sweet, salt, sour, bitter, heat, and umame. And it's about being local and thoughtful in that food. So when you're in a tropical environment, a lot of the food and the ingredients that comes from the continent of Africa makes the most sense. Because, you know, just like today, hot climate really changes how we eat, right? And when you're in a, in a more four season climate that we have, here in New York and, and obviously my restaurant in, in, in Montreal as well, 
we are probably, you know, we're, we're blending it in a little bit more different from, I would say, influences from Africa. So I use a lot of Berbere from Ethiopia, I use a lot of grains from Africa, uh, but predominantly it's, it's a red rooster, uh, Southern American inspired, right? Uh, and in, in Canada, it's more seafood based. So it, it depends on what res restaurant. Yeah, yeah. But I think I see everything becoming just that much more diverse. Mm -hmm. Now, how did you find all of these chefs that are featured in the book? Mm -hmm. So we really had, Usai and I, the co-writer, we had two completely different ways to go about it. And it was so great to work with her on this because a lot of the chefs came up in my kitchens, whether it was from Aquavit days or it was a Red Rooster days. Uh, so I had one set of chefs that, whether it worked for me still or not, that was in sort of the past of what worked me before. Then also, Usai went out to across, travel across the country to, to meet other food writers and chefs, right? So, because uh, we wanted influences from so many different people. And we were lucky to have, you know, amazing Jessica B. Harris in the book. Uh, we had, of course, Leah Chase in the book. Kwame was in the book. Um, you know, just the, the best and the brightest in the culinary field, Michael Twitty and chefs like that. And a lot of food writers that are not, as fairly traditional chefs. And for me, it was fascinating when Usai came back from a trip. Guess who I met? Guess what we talked about? <laughs> this is what, and it was just like every time she came back, I'm like, tell me their story. And I think that's one of the reasons why the book is done so well, because whether you knew these chefs or not, they all share an incredible story. And um, these recipes are great food and something that everybody can enjoy. Yeah. You know, you've alluded, on a, and so have I, to your background, but there may be people who aren't aware of <clears throat> your unusual background, shall we say. Could you give us a quick capsule? And I also want to tell you that one of your best books is the one about becoming a chef. Yes, uh, chef. Thank you. I, 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 I couldn't put it down. Thank uh, you. Right. So, uh, yeah, I mean, I might be the only Swedish opium you know. But, you know, I say that with pride because I was born in a, in a small village called um, Abrogodena. It's a tiny village two hours outside uh, Addis, Addis Abeba. And uh, my mother, my sister and I, we had tuberculosis and then we were, she really walked us into the capital and eventually uh, she got us to a Swedish hospital, um, uh, a Swedish affiliated hospital is, is a better term. And um, there... Eventually she passed away, we survived. Uh, a nurse at the hospital took us in. So again, a lot of luck and a lot of uh, random circumstances, right? Uh, and eventually we got uh, adopted to Sweden. And that's how you go from being Kastahun Sigai to Marcus Samuelson, like that. <laughs> you go from the warmest country in the world to the coldest country in the world. <laughs> and I grew up in Gothenburg, which is the second largest city in Sweden. Uh, the very like workman blue collar. I call it like Pittsburgh by the sea. That's really what it is. It's a blue collar, but a beautiful city in its own way. And uh, we grew up eating herring and gravlax and Vasa crisp bread and dressed in H&M and our bed were from Ikea and just like any other Swede, you know? And then eventually cooking the became meatballs alive. Were, the meatballs were from your grandmother, not from yes. Ikea. <laughs> yes, yes, Florence, absolutely. The meatballs were definitely from my grandma. I will tell you a funny story, though. My mo mom always tried to be more modern than my grandmother. So she's like, I don't have time to make meatballs for the whole family. So she used to do this one big, if you can imagine the meatball, like she did one big, almost like a giant burger, seared it in the skillet, put it in the oven, flipped it, and then we have to cut it out. And, you know, we, every time she made the meatballs, you know, we biked over to my grandma's house and got real meatballs the same night, a double dinner when mom cooked meatballs at my house. So, but, um, you know, uh, food became my life pretty early. My, my uh, I did internships in great restaurants in France and Switzerland and Austria. And eventually was lucky enough to get a job at Aquavit. And that's really where we met. And, um, 
had a chance to learn and study and really grow up in at Aquavit as a young chef, as learning, I've learned the business. Um, I, I learned so much during the years at Aquavit. I learned how to really become a New Yorker in the city. And eventually, like most chefs, you want to do your own thing. You want to do something that um, narratively fits you and are you and, 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 and you know, had a great 15 years experience at Aquavit. And then when it was time to move on, it was time to move on. Yeah, inevitably, that's what chefs want to do. And that's what they continue to do. And a lot of the chefs that you profile in the book certainly have gone that route. Yeah. What about buying certain ingredients like Berberis spices mm -hmm. or some of the grains? Uh, is that <laughs> something people can start to find in supermarkets or is it still very specialty and you've got to order it online or find an ethnic market or whatever? What yeah, about- but I, think, I think it's a blend and it's gotten a lot of, it's gotten so much better, right? So in major cities like New York, DC, Chicago, Houston, the great African markets, fantastic. Um, I would say online, there's also great spaces now, really good Amazon and, and smaller marketplaces really have helped. And then I would also say, go to restaurants, go to one of those Moroccan and Ethiopian restaurants and buy ingredients directly from restaurants. And I would also, the last one I would always highlight is Kalustian, like for anything else. Kalustian has oh, yeah. a great spice section that covers Northern Africa and East Africa and West Africa. Uh, specific markets in Harlem has great places. But I would definitely say go down to 26th Street, 27th Street, and you will find most of the ingredients that you need. They also sell online <laughs> because if people are out here, they don't have access directly to Kalustian. Yeah. And uh, markets that do have certain ingredients like um, uh, cavanolas or citarella yeah. are very, very limited in what they offer. I think maybe up island there might be more or the big <coughs> thing in seems to be better stocked. But it's, I think it's a challenge. And It, uh, it is, but I've, I've even watched now, for example, Whole Food, right? They have teff, the grain, that comes from Ethiopia, the world's oldest grain, and it's gluten-free. And making a great bread with teff or making noodles, if you want gluten-free noodles with teff, it's fantastic, for example. And you can go to Whole Food today and buy that. Five years ago, that was not possible, for example, right? And that's a major step. My, our friend, Philippe uh, Alopierre, Atiam, thank you sells Fonio today. Fonio you can buy and Whole Foods. So Pierre has done a great job pushing that. And Fonio, if you can cook couscous, you can cook Fonio. Sometimes it's harder to pronounce something than to cook it. But guess what? We learned, <laughs> we learned through Italian food. We learned through Indian food to try different ingredients, right? Um, if you can cook orso, you can cook Fonio. It's actually even easier. If you can cook bulgur, you can cook Fonio. So, Sometimes it's just, okay, I'm going to take a chance today and it's not going to go bad and I'm going to turn it around and, and commit to it. Yeah. So in preparing the book, did you go to a lot of these restaurants or was it your co-author that did most of that? We did a, co a combination. A lot of these chefs I knew uh, and some of them were not chefs, right? So some of them are authors or food writers. So I probably, Harrison. Yeah, I probably uh, spoke to 67% of all the chefs, uh, either in person or I've been to their restaurants and I knew their journey, right? Like someone like Nina uh, Compton, I was I'm very familiar with her journey and we talk and we work together on events and also by hosting our food festival, Harley Meet Up, that is now it's in its seventh year. Uh, I met and invited in these chefs for so many years, right? So we've actually, up until the pandemic, we hosted Harlem Eat Up in Harlem every year in May. And we brought 15,000 people to come to Harlem and eat and meet a lot of these chefs.
just like a New York food and wine experience, right? So through the festival and through the work of the restaurant, I've been able to either host the chefs, talk to them, or hold author's night for them. So it's uh, the privilege of being active in the city, having a huge restaurant in the city, and, and, and uh, having the access to a lot of the chefs um, means that I know them deeply. Yeah, I mean, I, I looked through the book. I haven't tried any of the recipes yet, but I was also a little amused that one of the earliest recipes in the book is for French croissant. Yes, absolutely. You know, Chef Eric, nobody makes better, better in croissants than Chef Eric, but he, of course, makes it with uh, chicken liver butter. Yeah. You know? So I was like, you know, we're gonna showcase all of his experience. So we have a curry that comes from Martinique. Then we have a beautiful scallop dish that is sort of more the fine dining. And then of course, a, uh, a beautiful croissant, which speaks to uh, his long experience, but also, you know, he worked at some of the best three-star Michelin restaurants in Paris as well, so. Right. Um, and you take some of the dumpling, uh, some of the recipes like the cassava dumplings with the callaloo. This is Nina Compton, yeah. callaloo puree. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's not terribly complicated. Yeah. And the callaloo puree is almost like doing a, a spinach puree. But you're thinking about it because you know food, right, Florence? And the way you're thinking, I wish more, that's exactly how you should think about it, right? Callaloo is essentially similar to spinach. Right, or mustard or, or yeah. exactly mustard greens or even sweet potato leaves. Right, it has that little heavier sort of um, uh, flavor and texture. But guess what? We can substitute that with something, right? And dumpling. Every culture has and dumpling. Every culture has dumplings and fried chicken. Yes, everybody has one. <laughs> yeah, or uh, Stephen Satterfield. Uh, uses bene seed paste. Now you can use sesame seeds instead, yeah. and you can use tahini instead yeah. of seed paste and have it work just as easily in some of these recipes. But even what you were talking about, this dialogue that we're having now, it's exactly what I want, right? Because I wanted some of the words not to be changed. Bene seeds, so there's West African sesame seeds, but like you said, tahini or sesame seed paste, it just shows you how the world is more similar than different. Of course, in West Africa, it's going to be not be called the same as it does maybe in, in the Middle East or in Southeast Asia, but it's very often the same ingredient, a similar plant very often, right? And once you do that conversion that you just quickly did, you know, okay, that could be tahini instead. And that's exactly how I want people to think about this. It's not well, difficult. Part of it is the way people cook. You and I go to the market and find something that's attractive and take it home and cook it. Yeah. And you don't first look at a recipe and check off every ingredient in the recipe and then go shopping. Uh, most people, particularly for dishes and cuisines that are not familiar, won't do that. And so I think they need guidance and I think that the, the way to really get under the skin, if you will, of some of these dishes is to think about what do these ingredients represent in terms of their flavor, their texture. Yeah. And you don't have to go that far afield. As I say, you can use benny seed paste for a uh, tahini for benny seed paste. And there are a lot of other substitutions. And then there are a lot of really easy recipes that exactly. are very familiar. Some of the barbecue stuff, yeah. the stews, the chicken, uh, you can put them on your table very easily and, and find what you need to make them right at your regular market. No, I would even say when, what year, do you remember what year you did the Moroccan book? Uh, we talked about the Moroccan book. That you told me that about, you were talking about, you wrote something about Morocco, long, like maybe it was 20 years ago, something like that. You wrote a big piece about Morocco. And it was maybe like 20 years ago. I would say today, it's much easier to cook African than it was 20 years ago because of internet and the access, right? And the way people traveled post the pandemic, uh, pre-pandemic, but the way people have access about it, Florence, right? 
So I would say for me, for example, somebody who helped me a lot in the book and did contributed amazing. is one of the colleagues you have now at the Times, uh, Yuanda, she works uh, uh, at the New York Times on right. the food section. Yeah. And she's been from West Africa. She brought so many of these recipes as well, because obviously her experience from West Africa with Saeed's experience from West Africa, you know, for me, it was very important to share my knowledge, but also being taught by both Usai and Jiwande. And they were incredible. This book would never have been the same book without the two of them. Yeah, yeah. Well, you know, it's having an open mind and an open palate in a way. Or if you go to the Caribbean, you know, most of the fancy hotels in the Caribbean serve continental food. And you've got to go into the side streets yeah. and find the little hole in the wall restaurants that might be a, a few wooden tables where you'll get a plate of rice with something and uh and it's delicious yeah so the best barbecue i ever had was on saint thomas of course uh, so yes. i was struck. yes no but you're curious and that's that's what food has given you right that license to look off the road a little bit and eat road food i mean and a lot of that is changing throughout the caribbean as well you know one this summer uh, my family and I we went to Bahamas and open our, uh, you know, in Bahamar, and it's been so much fun to work in the brigade with. Ninety percent of the chefs come from Bahamas, and I learned about conch. They taught me about conch. You know, I taught them the techniques that I have, and and our restaurant in at Bahamar is right on the water. But to do this collaborative effort, and uh, to do it with, like I said, ninety-five percent of the chefs are local. And it's really been a blessing. And I had to go many times back and forth to learn about the local cuisine. And I take so much pride and, 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 and but it's also exciting to me to eat road food, be inspired by it, and then figure out how can I bring another version or, or a different version of that to the restaurant. But um, I think that, I think that food is always exciting when you keep an open mind, right? And yeah. we will expand and travel when we come out of the pandemic because we're curious people, you know, and, you know, food has taken me to so many different places. Um, in spring, Florence, I'm going to open a new restaurant in New York, in Chelsea. And it's going to be, you know, I, obviously I'm thinking a lot about it right now in terms of seafood and sustainability and plant-based and all these things that, you know, when you look at the environment, right, there's like, the, the heat wave in Greece and the fires in Greece and the California on the West Coast. As chefs, we have to do something towards this. We have to think about our carbon footprint. So all of these things impact me and my choices. So I think a lot about it for the new restaurant. That's interesting. Um, I think we're going to open this for the Q&A in a few minutes. But let me tell you something. Um, <clears throat> next week, uh, I think it's going to be next week. It depends a little on space and so forth. I've done a story that I've been wanting to do for the longest time about porgy. <clears throat> and it's a nice. wonderful fish. Yes. It's the deepest fish you can buy, and it is delicious. Yes. And most people don't pay it any mind. And the funny part is that they will eat imported orata, which is the same fish. Chefs call it sea bream and it's okay. But when you call it porgy, nobody wants it. And <laughs> the fish you want to put it on your menu. Yes, absolutely. I'm with you. That's great. Yeah. Have you do you use it? Do you have you cooked with it? I've cooked with porgy, absolutely. And it's delicious just like that. It has a firm texture to it and it works great at sauteing or blackening. It works in many different ways. And frying yeah. is delicious too. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, there are ingredients like that, as you say, even on your in your own backyard and forgetting the ethnicity of anything that uh, deserve more attention. But Florence, it has to do with a lot. You know, when we deal with poverty in our own country and when we deal with poverty from a foreign country, it's very different. When you think about how we celebrate and embrace poverty from Southern Italy, for example, from Calabria and Puglia, we want the dishes that are poor man's cooking with a very little protein, very much pasta driven with a bit of greens or a little bit of garlic in it. But when we deal with our own 
food that is uh, maybe the protein is something that we're not familiar with, or it's pig feet, or it's uh, you know you know not central plate, or it's it's not as interesting. And I've even, always thought about that. Even something like the dark meat of chicken. Yes. Which is the best part? Absolutely, <laughs> of course. <laughs> But yeah, that's a different discussion. That's next year. Yeah. So do you have another book on tap? Oh my God, please. <laughs> let, <laughs> let me, let me, like we just launched this a year ago and only in America, right? Like I remember when we do launch events now, you know, because it's in, not in person, same way. People ask me the same day, so what's your next book? I was like, what's my next book? I just launched this book. What are you talking about? Leave me alone. And you've got a restaurant on the way. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Well. You know, we could go on forever with this conversation, yeah. but I'm wondering if we do have questions from the audience. Uh, we have a question, uh, an attendee asks, um, you said you use plant-based ingredients sometime. Um, do you ever make gluten-free recipes? Sure. Well, I, I, I have to, um, I was, I've been very fortunate um, and I'm going to, curate the Met Gala this year um, that's going to be in September. And we decided together with Condé Nast and Anna Wintour and Vogue to the whole menu to be plant-based. And um, we're 10 other chefs that uh, will work with 10 other chefs that we're going to curate the menu that it's all plant-based. And so in this process, all spring, we've been going back and forth with gluten-free, plant-based ideas. So I've been in this sort of vegetarian vegan space now for the last two, three months, actually. So when you talk about gluten-free, well, something that is very dear to me, injera bread, which comes from a home country in Ethiopia, it's delicious. It's done with an incredible healthy grain and teff, and it's gluten-free. So that would probably be the ingredients I would highlight the first. Well, most of the grains used in Africa, they don't yeah. use wheat. It's mostly... Yeah. Uh, gluten-free grains, yes. bono is gluten-free, yeah. uh, fufu, uh, yeah. rice is yeah. gluten-free. So it's kind of naturally gluten-free for whatever mm -hmm. reason, but it's not, a, I think it's because the climate isn't, and cassava, mm -hmm. you know, cassava flour, um, but the climate is not conducive to raising wheat. Yeah. So they have other grains there. Yeah. Of course, and they're older and the processing is different. So, so I think there's a lot of things that we, you can eat just as delicious gluten-free, absolutely. Do we have any other questions? Uh, let's see, um, if anyone has any questions, uh, please feel free to uh, type it in the chat. The floor is open. Well, I guess not, so we'll continue. Marcus, question for you on, you can buy the Ethiopian spice blend, Berbera, if I'm pronouncing it correctly. Sure. And if you wanted, if somebody wanted to cook Southeast Asian, they would know to buy soy sauce and maybe a fish sauce and rice vinegar. Uh, and with those condiments in hand, you can make a dish begin to taste a bit like Southeast Asia. What condiments, bottle stuff people can find, would you recommend to turn your palate and your seasonings in the direction of West Africa? Okay, so I would say, if we start at East Africa for a second, with Berbera, you go far, right? Because that has a lot to do with it. But I would also say chickpea flour, which we call in East Africa, we call it shiro. Chickpea flour is amazing. You just simmer, you take chickpea flour, a little bit of onion, very often like Indian ghee, that clarified yeah. butter. Right well, in, chickpea flour is used all the time in India. Yes, and it's used in all over the Middle East, right? But I would say, so with berbere, chickpea flour, and a little bit of a ghee, which in Ethiopia, we, we call it kebe, which is really a fermented spiced butter, right? With those three ingredients, you simmer that with a little bit of water, even let's say 
some chopped tomatoes and onions. You now have a chickpea porridge or like almost like it doesn't taste like a hummus, but it has that feel to it. Right there, you have a beautiful, wonderful chickpea puree that you now can build off, right? If you add bear bread to that, you can even add charred corn to that for the summer or roasted pumpkin to that. And you have a wonderful meal that gives you sort of the nuance of East African food. When I think about West Africa, I think about rice, broken rice very often. And there's some- What makes it broken? So it's really the leftovers of the rice. The, the, the rice that is harvested that is not as perfect as the rice that you get in our bags gives it that broken rice feel, which now is funny, Florence, to say, a lot of chefs buy perfect rice, put it in the blender and breaks <laughs> it up. So they go the opposite way. But what I would say that would make it very specific to West African often is fermented shrimp paste, Think um, about how you think about Korean kimchi, you have that same fermented flavor. If you cook some right regular rice and you add in a tablespoon of fermented shrimp paste or fermented crayfish paste, it will give you a smell that constantly right away reminds me of Senegal, Nigeria, and the whole West Coast of Africa because um, there is a rice there that all the West African countries always compete on. Uh, and it's jollof rice. And it's one of the oh. most delicious rices. Yeah. <laughs> and the way, uh, you know, you eat the paella in Spain, that's how West African culture eats jollof rice. Well, there are a lot of arguments about who makes the best jollof Yes. <laughs> I'm staying out of those. I'm staying out of those. <laughs> the other dish, my son has visited West Africa a number of times on business. And the what the one thing that he really loves is yasa. Yes, yasa is amazing too, which you have onion and almost like a confit and you, you use it a lot with lamb, for example. And there's so many incredible foods from out of West Africa. There is another uh, uh, street food dish in Nigeria called suya, which is really this skewered beef that you very often is eaten late at night. Um, the suya stands come out and it's, it's, it's skewered beef that first is fried, then it's grilled. And then this peanut sauce is glazed on top of it. And it's absolutely delicious. And, you know, I think it's fascinating that you bring out Asia because so much of business and traveling and tourism is connected. Some of the dishes that you talk about, whether it's from Vietnam or with certain parts of China, didn't really become mainstream American dishes until trading took place. And after trading yeah. comes tourism. And after tourism comes magazine and exposure, right? So when we come back out of this time and we start travel again, I hope um, people explore West Africa because it's fantastic when it comes to food and experiences. Yeah, yeah. You know, back to chickpea flour, it's used a lot in the south of France on the Riviera. Yeah. Yes, you're right. Absolutely. It is. Exactly. You're right. It is. And, uh, you know, and I guess there was trading that way as well. Oh, sure. I mean, the French has been all over Africa. I'm sure they brought some of the best ingredients with them. So, <laughs> yeah, yeah. So are you, do you have any plans to travel? Well, I've been traveling back and forth the whole summer to Sag Harbor to our house there and where my son um is it's just we've just been so fortunate being out there and um going back and forth and going to the farmer's market at sag harbor has been a wonderful addition for us and uh just exploring and enjoying the summer and quite trying to figure out a, a a normal way of being in this very challenging time yeah yeah well sag harbor is lovely i think we have another question or two uh let's see we have a question. Would you consider a pop-up out here on the East End? I just did a pop-up. We were just talking about it in the at the Old Stove Pub with my dear friend, Scott Feldman. Uh, he does this Tuesday pop-up when he invites out his great chef friends. And we had so much fun. I mean, just the pure joy of cooking in a pub. You know what I mean? I We had with the team and the customers and being out there. It was just so much fun. 
we have um, another question from Marcus. Where do you like to eat when you're on the East End? Well, there's, there's a, every summer is always exciting to see which city restaurant is coming out. But, <laughs> you know, I, the most I enjoy is actually going to the farmer's market with no idea what I'm going to cook. And then just go at it, whether it's looking at corn or looking at different ingredients and then bring that home and I have a wonderful grill and I just put it all on the grill and just exploring, not to have putting that traditional chef hat but on, but actually just cooking for my family with my son. Uh, he likes to cook more than he likes to eat. And I just enjoy that, you know, that feel, I feel so blessed to be able to do that. We bike over to the farmer's market, we stuff the bags and then we bike back. Does your wife cook? She does, but I enjoy, I mean, she cooks real Ethiopian food and that's traditional and it's done her way and I'm allowed to chop and, and, and that's, uh, that's about it. Uh, but when my, Zion and I cook, it's, it's putting corn on the grill and glazing it and figuring out whether, you know, uh, there is a new ingredient that is into, right now it's into radishes how bitter they are, and you, we're just tasting stuff. How old is he now? Five. Five. That's a good age. That's exactly the age when I started to hang out with my grandmother. And I remember, you know, there's things that you remember that, you know, I even remember how my grandmother tasted stuff, right? She poured stuff, not with a spoon, with a ladle, straight into her palm, into her hand. Because she didn't think like, the metal of the spoon, would, that would give a different taste. Like things like that, that is just so old school. And I remember being with Leah Chase, she tasted the same way. She didn't taste with a spoon, she poured straight into her hand, you know? I'm not doing that with my son, by the way. But. <laughs> and you're not doing it in the restaurant. No, no, no. <laughs> we have a question. Um, how do you grill corn? Well, I think it's, it's now is the perfect time to try. You can do many different ways, but you can actually grill, grill it with the husk on, which creates yep. this almost like oven, this beautiful oven, right? You can soak them actually in water also before, right? So they don't, you don't want them to get charred and too burned because then uh, the corn kettle really, uh, that sweetness, that beautiful sweetness, that pulp that you want becomes a little bit dried out, right? So, and also, you don't need to cook them with the highest heat. Sometimes on low on the grill, almost the way the Japanese grill something, it's better because you can control it. And then I think once you take them off the grill, especially now, just salt, maybe even some smoked paprika on it. Now during the summer, the less ingredients you put on the corn, the better. Brush them with some butter and some salt and they're super delicious. Although I'm a fan of mayonnaise on my corn. <laughs> something maybe. There's something they do in Southern Mexico, and yeah. I think it's fabulous. Now, in terms of soaking the corn before you grill it, if you do soak it, you can open the husk and pull mm. out the silk. Mm. So, and then put close the husk back up so that when you serve it, it doesn't have all the silk there. And what do you do with that? Mm -hmm. So it's it's a very versatile way of preparing of preparing the corn. And when you finish or if you scrape the kernels off the corn for a recipe, you save the cobs to make stock. Yes, yes, I mean, stop, stop, stop. That is actually the best idea because that corn broth, right? And it, let's say you have shrimp or shellfish or clams or whatever, oh, you cannot that. eat better than the next day clam soup made with corn cob. It's just so delicious. The natural sweetness you're gonna get from that the blend between the corn and the clam, for example, it gives you the best soup you can have. Okay, so it's a good note to end on unless we have more questions. I think it's just about, let me look, 6.59, well done. Marcus. Well, I think Florence, uh, first of all, I wanna thank you for all the years that you brought people together through this but also obviously you supported chefs from all backgrounds and you constantly broadcast them in the, in the paper. And we thank you for that. And I think it's time for you to run that fig tart again, cause it's damn good. <laughs> oh, I've 
made it since then. No, no, run it in the paper. Oh. Run it in the paper, share it. Yeah, that's more work than it's probably. <laughs> <laughs> Send it to you want it. You want to contest it out for you. There you go. That's true. That's yeah. true. Send it to you want it. It may be in there. I don't know. I'll have to look. Yeah, yeah. Anyway, you stay well and uh, hope our paths cross soon. Of course. And, uh, keep cooking. Thank you so much. And I'd, like, you. I'd like to thank you both for uh, being able to uh, join us this evening for uh, this author's event series. And uh, we wish you both the best in your endeavors. And... Happy eating. <laughs> thank you. And I also want to take the moment to say thank you to Miss Lana Turner that connected me with this again. And, uh, you know, uh, I'm so blessed and privileged to be part of the cooking community because in times like this, when we really have time to think about our privileges, it's imp important to acknowledge each other and be there for one another because it's been a tough year. And I think by breaking bread and learning about other culture is one way to come back and really celebrate each other. So thank you.